Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Phil Sharp, and on behalf of the Institute of Politics, want to welcome uh, our First Lady, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, and welcome all of you to this very special forum. The Institute of Politics was created 30 years ago as a living memorial to President John F. Kennedy with a mission to encourage student interest in public service. The President's late brother, the Senator Robert F. Kennedy, was instrumental in founding the Institute, and we're very pleased to have with us today his wife, Ethel Kennedy, as well as... as well as several other members of the Kennedy family. We're also very pleased to have with us, of course, the president of Harvard University, Neil Rudenstein. <laughs> and the president of Radcliffe College, Linda Wilson. <laughs> this is a day of firsts, the first time a first lady has spoken at Harvard and the first time a forum event will be broadcast on the internet with live audio. Working with our partner, uh, AudioNet, Mrs. Clinton's speech will be heard around the world. Introducing the First Lady will be Joseph Nye, the Dean of the Kennedy School of Government. Dean Nye is a renowned scholar of international security matters and has been an advisor to the U.S. government for many years. Prior to returning to Harvard last December, he served as Assistant Secretary of Defense. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Nye. Thank you, Phil, and I want to welcome you all to a very special event here at the Forum. We're very honored to have Hillary Rodham Clinton to address us at this Forum, which is an important part of the education we have at the Kennedy School. We sometimes say that uh, regardless of what you learn in the classes, you learn almost as much just by being around here and listening to what's going on, and this Forum is an important part of that education. So we're particularly delighted that Mrs. Clinton can join us today. Most of you know of Hillary Clinton, of course, as a graduate of Wellesley College and a graduate of Yale Law School. What may be less well known is that she's long been interested in the cause of women and children. Immediately after graduating from law school, she served as an attorney for the Children's Defense Fund and later returned to that organization as a member of its board of directors. During the same period, she was legal counsel to the Carnegie Council on Children. A bit later, after becoming First Lady of Arkansas, Mrs. Clinton authored the Handbook on Legal Rights for Arkansas Women and founded the Arkansas Advocates for Women and Children. She also introduced Arkansas's Home Instruction Program for Preschool Youth, a program which trains parents to work with children in preschool preparedness and literacy. So she's a longstanding expert and advocate on issues of children and family. And the most recent expression of that is her book, It Takes a Village and Other Lessons Children Teach Us, which of course is of interest to parents, teachers, clergy, and to many people here in this room today. We understand that the Clinton family is currently exploring the possibilities of their child's next community. <laughs> but we'll leave that in suspense for the future. Today, we're particularly proud to welcome Hillary Clinton to the Harvard community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here. And it gives me such great pleasure uh, to be here at the Kennedy School and to be, at least for a few hours, part of this village. I want to thank Joe Nye uh, for his service, not only here at this school, but also to our country. I want to thank Phil Sharp for his service here and to our country. Uh, both of these men are living examples of what it means uh, to try to live a life of public service with integrity and intelligence. I want to thank your president, Neil Rudenstein, for his leadership of this great university. And all of you who are associated 
uh, with the Kennedy School uh, for what you are doing in bringing to uh, greater public attention uh, many of the issues that we struggle with in our public lives and which all of us need to be more knowledgeable about and to participate in seeking solutions for. I was thinking as uh, Joe Nye introduced me that uh, I spent a lot of time on the Harvard campus when I was a Wellesley student. Um, <laughs> and I spent a lot of very anxious hours racing back to Wellesley when there used to be curfews. Um, and then I had the very odd experience of following my daughter around as she has visited campuses, including Wellesley's and Harvard's, uh, and feeling very much older than I ever had before. But it is a great honor for anyone in any capacity to be on the Harvard campus and to know that for so many years, so many centuries now, uh, this university with all of its constituent parts has helped to lead our country and the world as we've attempted to make sense of the changes that we have confronted. This is what I want to talk about with you today because we are, as we perhaps always have been, living again in a time of profound transformation, a time of great uncertainty, but also of great opportunity. In country after country, we have seen changes being acted out on the world stage. Communism giving way, capitalism attempting to take root, moving from tyranny to democracy, trying to understand what democracy means, seeing closed markets open up to free trade and dealing with the strains that that imposes. We've seen old tensions and new hatreds born in too many places. On the eve of this new century, we know that all of you who are students here face so many more possibilities than I even could have dreamed of when I was a student. We know very well that new technology is bringing the world closer together, changing the way we communicate and do business, but we are also reminded that virtual reality will never substitute for human connections and relationships. This is perhaps most importantly noticed in the area of family life. As we look at what is happening to families, particularly in countries like ours, but increasingly throughout the world, we see that there are questions being raised about the proper and appropriate roles of women and men within the home and outside, questions about child rearing, who is supposed to do what in our most intimate relationships. And in a world where consumerism is one of the primary messages transmitted, we see that growing material expectations put new demands on institutions from the family to government. And we also know that many of those expectations are unlikely to be realized anytime soon. With technology and the other forces of history literally changing the face of how we live together, we are all asking ourselves, in the privacy of our own homes, with close friends, with those with whom we share these relationships, how will we confront the challenges we face in these times? And that is particularly important when it comes to children and families. Over the past years, I've had the opportunity to talk with many people here in the United States and around the world about society's obligations to children. And based on what I've seen and heard, I think there is both good news and bad news. The good news is that we are having this conversation that here at the Kennedy School, issues about family life, about raising children, are considered important and on the agenda. Good news because 
I see many people reevaluating how they spend their time and where their priorities should be, both individually and as members of communities. Bad news because we don't have any easy answers to these complex challenges. And often we wonder whether we will have any answers anytime soon at all that can be generalizable beyond the individual decisions about how to order our private lives. There are some who believe discussions about children and family life don't properly belong on the front burner of important matters that take up the time not only in public meetings, but in boardrooms and elsewhere. I think that these issues, far from being soft issues or often dismissed as women's issues, are among the hardest ones we face. If we think about America's future progress and prosperity, I think we would agree that to a large extent that depends upon strong and stable families that are raising children who are able to function well in a world where change is the only certainty. We've been through this before, I would suggest. If one looks at what happened at the turn of the last century, I think we can see that during the so-called progressive era, many of the debates that were held were fueled by concerns primarily articulated by women about what we needed to do to care for children and to provide better conditions for working and living for all. There were great debates about child labor, wage and hour laws, workplace conditions. As we shifted as a society from an agrarian one to a more industrial one, grassroots efforts led by women reformers like Jane Addams and Eleanor Roosevelt resulted in some of the most lasting pieces of social legislation that we achieved in this century. The progressive movement arose because women's issues and children's issues turned out to be critical to economic and social progress. Today, as we confront new circumstances and new challenges, most notably here at home with parents working, if there are two in the home or a single parent, often working longer hours with less time they feel to devote to their children, then we have to recognize that again, at the end of this century, these issues are important enough for all of us to pay attention. It is not only women who are affected by what we do privately and publicly to support families. Men are too. How then, amid the uncertainties we face, will we meet our obligations to our children and ensure that they are given the opportunities to grow up to be responsible citizens? I have argued that certainly while parents are first and foremost responsible for raising children, each one of us is responsible for helping to build a healthy, functional environment in which these children are raised. Children, after all, exist in the world as well as in their families. They depend on a host of adults who influence their lives, relatives and neighbors and teachers and coaches and clergy, all touch their lives directly and indirectly. And so do adults who police the streets, monitor the quality of food, air, and water, produce programs that appear on television, run the businesses that employ parents, and write the laws we live by. That's why I chose the old African proverb, it takes a village, for the title of my book. Believing that it takes a village to raise a child is not just a statement of principle or an effort to be altruistic and call on others to be so as well. I think it is a very self-interested statement. No family is immune to the influences of the larger society. 
I don't want my own daughter to grow up in an America sharply divided by income, race, or religion. I'd like to minimize the odds of her suffering at the hands of someone whose own childhood was marred by neglect, violence, lack of love, and discipline. I want her to believe that the American dream is within reach of anyone willing to work hard and take responsibility. I want her to live in an America that lives up to its reputation throughout the world as a land of hope and opportunity. And I want the same for all children. Over the past months and years, I have visited with many people around our country who are making a difference on behalf of children, and I have seen problems solved. As my husband is fond of saying, there is not a problem in America that has not been solved somewhere in America. But often we don't know about what is happening down the road or in the next community. We don't try to replicate what works. We don't move to scale programs and policies and attitudes that can make a difference. And one of the best efforts that has been made here at the Kennedy School is to recognize and honor such programs and people who are making a difference. Earlier today, I was at the Ford Elementary School in Lynn, Massachusetts. Many of the families there are on welfare or certainly not economically well off. And not so long ago, the school ranked last in achievement in its county. But a new principal came in and did what we know works. She encouraged parents to become more involved in their children's education. She brought together faculty and community leaders and set up night classes for parents, special family nights and after school and Saturday enrichment programs. She started summer school. She encouraged parents to get their GED and to go with her to visit the homes of children who were not showing up at school or misbehaving or not doing well. She instituted a voluntary uniform policy with most students and all the faculty participating. She did it with the help of federal, state, and local grants. She did it with the help of businesses who contributed. But she mostly did it by creating what they now call the Ford Family Village, by giving the parents and the members of the surrounding neighborhood a stake in the education and upbringing of all the children. Today, that school ranks in the top five out of 18 in the county, and attendance rates are consistently above 95%. What is fascinating about this example and the many others I have seen is how it demonstrates that small investments, changes in attitude, leading to incremental changes often produce unexpectedly big results. I've read a lot recently about the so-called epidemic theory. Advanced by some social scientists and public health experts, suggesting that even modest changes can tip the balance from negative cultural patterns to positive ones. And I have seen that. I have seen the quality of life improve because of school uniforms or curfew policies, because guns were taken out of the hands of young people and basketballs were put into them. I have seen the difference it makes when parents are encouraged by their employers to attend parent-teacher conferences. And I have seen how whole communities have developed more pride and more belief in the future because they have seen progress with their own eyes they can count on. Even such modest steps require the involvement of every segment of society. Parents, community organizations, clergy, educators, business people, the media, and yes, the government. I realize that in some quarters, the mere mention of the word government conjures up images of big, bloated bureaucracies that can't manage themselves, let alone solve any problem. My husband often says that the critics who take that line about government say that government couldn't organize a one-car parade. 
And I know saying anything positive about government is likely to be taken out of context or misinterpreted, but I think I'll take the risk. Because I know that government is not a cure-all for every social ill. That is not my view of government, nor do I believe it is most people's. It is certainly clear that here at the Kennedy School, you have attempted to promote a meaningful discussion about what the role of government ought to be. My view of government is pretty old-fashioned. It is of government as an instrument to promote the common good and to protect individuals' rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a view of government as a partner of families, communities, and businesses addressing our common problems. It's government working side by side with the rest of us. I have been privileged to travel in many other countries during the last four years, and I have seen firsthand people struggling to define their own idea of government, whether in India or in Bosnia or in Chile. I've listened as people have told me of their own experiences being tortured or imprisoned or seeing relatives assassinated because they were attempting to promote democracy and doing so because they saw the United States as a model. I have listened as young Peace Corps volunteers have talked to me about their experiences in very different cultures from the one that they had grown up in. And I particularly remember a young woman Peace Corps member who is serving some 10 hours outside of Kathmandu who had to take buses and walk many miles to see me. And as she talked with me, she expressed how excited she was to be teaching in a school where unfortunately most of her students were boys because girls are still not encouraged to attend school. But she had very many fond memories that she would live with for the rest of her life. But she couldn't help expressing to me how she missed the daily pace and blessings of life that we take for granted here. She missed things like water that she could drink out of a tap or food she could eat without worrying about getting sick or free public schools for both boys and girls and warm baths when she wanted them and paved roads and phones that worked. And she said to me, you know, I thought at first I was kind of thinking about trivial things when I missed all of that, but I realized we worked very hard in our country to be able to create a functioning society that did provide such things to all of us. When it comes to the well-being of families, and children, government has a role, as do we all. And I think it's important to end the false debate that has dominated some of our political rhetoric that pits government against families. I particularly like what the United States Catholic Conference said about this debate in putting children and families first, which was published as a pastoral letter in 1991. They said, no government can love a child and no policy can substitute for a family's care. But government can either support or undermine families as they cope with moral, social, and economic stresses of caring for children. For the sake of our children and our future, that false debate pitting families against government needs to end. Both personal and mutual responsibility are essential for a society that nurtures children. We need to stop stereotyping government and individuals and recognize that we all must be part of the solutions. Despite our imperfections and flaws, this system of government and politics has endured. I sometimes wonder how when I'm asked questions in various locales. Usually I'm asked, how, Mrs. Clinton, can you stand politics? And depending upon the day that I've had, I sometimes <laughs> wonder myself. But I usually respond by saying to the person who asked, 
Are you a member of any group? Have you ever been part of any effort to change anything? Are you married? Um, politics, um, <laughs> with a small p, is not just about who is elected to office. It is about our responsibilities in a democracy, how each of us participates to help all of us resolve the challenges and conflicts that inevitably arise in any social setting. I hope that as we move toward this new century and millennium that awaits, we will find that so-called children's issues and women's issues are on the forefront of our political agenda, that we are all looking for ways to help each of us better balance our family and work responsibilities, support those who need a helping hand, provide opportunities, and ask for responsibility. I say that because I believe it's essential if we are to build the kind of strong American community that we need for the next century. My husband often talks about expanding opportunity and demanding responsibility, but not just as ends in themselves, but as means of providing for a stronger community for all. That's especially important for us to remember as we look around the world and we see so many conflicts in so many places and we recognize that education in and of itself may or may not lead to a better life, a safer and stabler economy or society. I was struck forcefully by that notion when I visited Bosnia last spring with my daughter. If you study that terrible conflict that led up to the Dayton Peace Accords and all that has transpired since then, you know that many of those who led the calls for ethnic cleansing were educated people. They had economic means, many of them, but they had no sense of a larger community in which we respected one another, we worked to help each other raise our children, we crossed boundaries that divided us. And I was struck by that when I spoke with civilians at the American military headquarters in Tuzla who had been gathered. There were Muslim and Croatian and Serbian Bosnians. And they talked about what it was like trying to keep a society together when their villages were blown apart. It was hard to find refuge for any particular family to make it on its own. Some, I'm sure, were able to escape, but for the vast majority of people, they understood clearly that without some way of supporting each other and respecting each other and living with differences, no matter what an individual family tried to do for its children, it was not likely to succeed. I listened as women told me about the knocks on the door from neighbors surrounded by strangers who had come to take away their husbands or their fathers or their sons. I talked with doctors and nurses who tried to keep clinics open under bombardment. And I listened as teachers talked about how impossible it was to keep teaching when children were being maimed and killed and disappearing. And person after person said to me, we don't know why it happened. We don't understand what occurred. And I was struck then, as I have been in many other places with these kinds of deeply seated, complex conflicts, how lucky we are that despite all of our flaws and imperfections, we have kept this large, diverse country together and moving forward. And the challenge for us now is to be sure that as we move to a new century, we carry with us the values of the past that have been working, but we recognize the changes we will have to confront and be equipped to meet them. And that is particularly important for our children and our young people. 
So when I wrote that book, I really wanted to start a conversation so that each of us could ask ourselves, what can I do in my village to make it possible for all children to have the opportunity to grow up and choose their own life's course? And here at this great university, I know how much time and effort is spent to try to figure out what needs to be done to move it forward, to keep it on the cutting edge. And I thank you for the contributions that you make. And I hope you, too, will be part of this conversation about what kind of village and country we want for our children. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Clinton. As befits a uh, good Wellesley woman, Mrs. Clinton asked in preparation for this, what do some of the faculty think of these ideas about children and families? Here at the Kennedy School, we have the Wiener Center for Social Policy, which we think is one of the leading centers on social policy in the country. And we've asked that the first four questions come from four faculty members at that center. and so. In answering your question, you'll also get an answer to your question. Let me ask first uh, Ron Ferguson, a longstanding member of the Kennedy School faculty and an expert on urban poverty. Ron? Thank you. Uh, let me begin by thanking you for the leadership that you're expressing on behalf of children. And the question that I will pose after I make a few comments is to have you talk a little bit more about the role of the church in your vision in the um, people you talk to and the activities that you observe as you go around the country and observe communities. Uh, a number of the projects I've done over the past 10 years have involved going into communities, um, observing and studying community-based programs, observing and studying uh, community-based efforts to de deal with things like the drug problem. And in each case, we see the church as either an important entity or a potentially important entity that people are trying to draw out. Um, we often hear people in public conversations and other conversations looking for quick fixes, trying to figure out what age group to focus on. Should we do early childhood? Should we do early elementary? Should we do early adolescence? Should we do late adolescence? Clearly there's no period during childhood that's, that's a throwaway period. Every period is important. The church is one of those places that deals with people through each of those um, periods. I used to run a program here for um, young people who were headed into graduate programs in public policy at various places across the country. And I ran a survey for them th that I administered to them and to um, children in an inner city or young adults in an inner city teen parenting program. And one of the last questions, kind of a throwaway question, I asked them, when you're um, feeling bad and you want to give up, things aren't going so well, what do you do or think about in order to not give up? And their answers almost universally fell into three categories. One was I think about all the work my mother and father have done to get me here and all the faith of my younger siblings having me in me and I don't want to let them down. The second was I've got a mission in life that I want to fulfill and I can't give up on that. But the third one was that I've, I'm doing God's work and I can't give up because it's important I'm doing God's work. Um, another um, program that I studied, or a project that I did, we visited 23 programs in six cities that serve inner city kids. And we talked to a number of people. Um, one woman I remember was a Sunday school teacher and a school teacher. And we asked her about what she thought was important about what she did with and for children. 
And she said, well, what I do as a school teacher is important, but I think spirituality is just so key, and I have to sneak that in when I'm, when I'm in school. I can't do that overtly. But in Sunday school, I can use my whole self. I can talk about my spiritual side. I can talk about my intellectual side. And I can connect children to an entire extended family. So even if they don't have personal families um, that are in the church, I can connect them to other people. So the church was even more important than school for her in terms of putting the whole picture together for children. Um, finally, I just completed a study of a, com of a community based program for high school dropouts, Youth Build. It gets some funding from, from HUD now. And, um, Kids go through a middle transition during the program when they have to make a break with the streets sometimes. And often there's been another culture, another set of obligations. They feel like they're betraying some of their old friends. They feel like they're selling out to some us versus them values, trying to become more like them um, than like the old us they've been accustomed to. And they have to come to terms with that. And they have to, one of the ways that they do that is to find moral, moral legitimacy in the aspirations there considering or being asked to take on. I remember one young woman talked about um, she doesn't go out stealing with her friends anymore because she's been going to church and she's decided that's just wrong. She's going to break out of that. She also talked about her friends accusing her of wanting a TV life. Are you just going over there because you want a TV life? TV is the only place they've seen people who have, or that she and her friends have seen people who live in houses with two car garages and two parent families and so on. Churches have such families. Churches are places where people can connect with such families. So it's very awkward for the public sector to involve religious institutions in an integral way. Um, it's also sometimes awkward for religious institutions to come out and become very socially activist. So I think I've talked probably longer than I should have, but <laughs> what, is, what do you think about the, the role of the church in this? Well, you know, I, I think uh, a lot about it, and uh, I wrote a a small chapter about uh, spirituality and church life uh, in the book because I think it's very important. I think that for many people um, it is the grounding that they cannot find otherwise in any other aspect of their private or public life. And I look at it from two perspectives. The first is that I've seen what churches can and uh, are doing around the country uh, to deal with a lot of very difficult social problems, many of the places that you've, I'm sure, visited and studied. Uh, there is a big effort underway for a lot of churches, um, particularly in inner city areas, but not completely, uh, to redefine their mission beyond just the borders of their own church and their own congregation. I was in St. Louis recently, and a group of um, uh, Protestant churches, a Catholic parish, and I think a couple of uh, uh, Jewish synagogues have banded together to provide mentors for inner city kindergartners. Uh, this is not anything that they ever would have thought of doing before, but they now see it uh, as a very important part of their self-identification. I've been in lots of other uh, churches uh, that have set up uh, support groups for all kinds of uh, personal problems that people face. Uh, so I do think that there is a real, uh, imp a really important role for churches to play. And I hope that more and more churches and religious institutions uh, will learn from each other about what they can do successfully. And the second point I would make is that even though there are difficulties in carving out some kind of uh, public religious partnership, I think that just as the work that uh, my husband did with the Secretary of Education and the Attorney General to define clearly uh, what is the religious role in school and how can religion uh, have a rightful place in the public square, um, I think there are ways of defining what churches can do in partnership with public institutions. It is already happening. You know, many of the uh, foster care systems and children's uh, charities are run by religious institutions and they contract with the state. Uh, so that there are some models, but I think we have to be more creative in creating coalitions of religious institutions and in providing support um, where it is possible and legally permissible uh, so that people feel that their churches have a stake in their communities and that they have a stake in their churches and we create some of that uh, 
change that can come from a critical mass uh, being able to take root in some of our communities around the country. Our next panelist is Julie Wilson, the director of the Wiener Center. Julie is not only a popular teacher and skilled researcher, but has also worked on these issues in state government. Julie? I'm going to have to stand or I won't be able to see Julie. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. I barely see Ron. Like Ron, I'd like to thank you very much for your leadership over many years uh, on issues of family and children. And I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the role of government and what we've learned. Uh, you described very eloquently the increasing stresses on family, which are not just stresses that deal with financial resources, but also stresses that deal with lack of time, mm -hmm. as more and more adults have to move into the labor market. In your book, your use and your speech, your use of the metaphor, the village, I think helps us all conceptualize what it needs, what we need to raise a child, what families need to support them in raising their children. And in the anecdotes in the book about your childhood, You've reminded us all very forcefully that we grew up in villages, many villages, and live in a village now. But if we think about these villages and we look across the country, it's clear that many of these villages are rich in resources. We look at some of the communities around Boston, not only are parents willing to pay money for schools, willing to have the high taxes that are necessary to provide safe streets and the other services, but they also come home from work and volunteer to coach the little league teams and the other sports teams. They teach in the faith community. They run various activities for their children. There are other communities that don't have the public services and don't have the private or informal social services as well. And my question has to do with what have we learned as we've watched government over the years about how we can help the communities that need the extra support to build this infrastructure without dampening the enthusiasm and the spirit of the communities where things are working very well now? That's a very good question because it is one of the um, issues that we're confronting as we try to figure out how to define government and government's responsibility and the appropriate uh, distribution of resources to what end. Uh, and I don't know that uh, we have any good answer to it yet because I think we are struggling through it. But let me just make a few comments based on my own perceptions about what's going on. And, and part, of, part of that is what my husband has tried to do because I think there's been a lot of um, uh, confusion to some extent because I think he's taken some different approaches and some different paths about how government should be supportive of communities. There are obviously programs that we hope will rebuild an infrastructure, um, whether it's the enterprise zones and the empowerment zones and the tax credits, the kind of things that you know, the president has pushed and is implementing uh, that we hope will recreate uh, some human capital as well as financial capital that will enable communities to uh, take more uh, control over what happens to them and their children. Uh, there are also a number of lessons that I think we've learned about how you create a climate in which people feel that they have a stake in their community and that it is worth their investing their precious time uh, in trying to make it work. And let me just go back to what I saw this morning, which was very exciting. In this community of Lynn, which many of you here know, is a community that is somewhat depressed because of the changes of the economy over the last uh, 50 years. Um, this was a school that really didn't have much of a future. One of the women who was on the panel with me is the mother of 15 children. That's more than you, Ethel. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe it. Um, and those 15 children, 12 of them have gone to this school. And she very bluntly said, you know, I was never involved. I never really had much to do with it because they didn't want me. Through a combination of government grants, government programs, you've begun to create some incentives for people to feel that they want to belong again. This community used community development block grants to open the school up at night and on weekends so that the community could once again feel that uh, it had a home there. Now that's not the really important part. That's just the seeding of the changes in attitude and culture that led this woman and the other mother who was on the panel to talk about how they are now fully invested, not just in their own child's education, but they told me about how they're on the doorstep of anybody whose child is not in school. 
They're bringing food to people who may be hungry because they've lost their job. They're trying to help other people who are dealing with serious uh, domestic problems. All of a sudden, what had been 50 years ago a community in a village that because of economic changes and social changes had disintegrated so that people were not invested in each other, once again is attempting to rebuild that. Government had a role, business had a role, the schools had a role. So I don't think there is any shortcut answer about how to do this. But I look to see government as a partner to help seed these kinds of efforts towards self-sufficiency and community building. And I think we have a lot of examples around the country about what works, and so we can take some of those lessons and apply them. Our third panelist is George Borjas, an economist who specializes on subjects of immigration. He's recently joined the Kennedy School faculty from the University of California, where he was an advisor to Governor Pete Wilson. George? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Clinton, for coming and taking the time to visit Harvard and the Kennedy School today and for sharing with us some of your thoughts on why it takes a village to raise children. Uh, before I get to my question, which is about school choice, I want to I wanna sort of make a couple of comments on your book and on your talk today. In reading your book, I was really struck by the fact that one can interpret the phrase it takes a village in a number of different ways. One way in which some people, I think unfairly, have interpreted it is the one that stresses the role of government action in the village. In this view, the people of the village through the government, in some sense, get together and take some action and enforce some kind of regulation on the village. For example, what kind of programs kids can watch on television. Uh, these government policies sometimes, sometimes mandate actions that families cannot or perhaps do not want to take on their own. So that some families will, obvious, will obviously not want to go along with that kind of action. But I actually think that what you meant to say in your book was a different kind of, it takes a village to raise children. And basically what you argued was the social and economic characteristics of the village have an impact on our children, whether it be the educational attainment of the village or the activities of parents and children engaged in, in the village, that somehow all these things matter in how, in, in our, in, and affect our children. This is one aspect of your argument that I actually found very intriguing the fact that the social environment has an impact on our children. So for example, if the village has many families who volunteer their time to help the less fortunate, some of that will rub off on our children and our children will have learned, learned a very valuable lesson from that. At the same time, if many families engage in drug abuse, our children will learn from that too and that will have a very bad impact on our children. So I think that because we and our children interact, as you say, with the entire village, uh, the village does matter in, de in the development of our children. So what I want to do is use li that line of thinking to question you a little bit about, the import about a, a specific aspect of the village, which I think is very important for children, and that is our schools. Uh, I think we would all agree that the type of school our children go to matter a lot. The quality of the teachers, the quality of the principal, as you talked about earlier, mm -hmm. and so on, right? Because of that, many parents often take action to influence the environment that the children are exposed to in school. Parents who can afford it pay a lot of money to send their children to private school. And that, that purchase allows them to send their children to a, to a safer school, better teachers, and so on. Many of us will also move to other cities, or perhaps commute long hours to move to a village, to use your phrase, that has a better school system. The poorest families among us, however, don't really have that opportunity, unfortunately. These families have to send their children to public schools in very poor neighborhoods. And we have all read about conditions in those schools. They are unsafe, they are crowded, and teachers are so busy disciplining that it's very hard to spend any time in real teaching to the, to the kids that need it the most. Many people believe that a good way to improve the quality of the schools, even of the schools in the poorest neighborhoods, would be for the schools to compete with each other to attract the students that they need in order to survive. In other words, all families, even the poorest families, should have the choice or should have the option of where they wish to send their children. This type of competition, which works very well in everything we buy, right? Refrigerators, bicycles, and I'm saying maybe schools, would introduce a system of checks and balances in the public school system and could even perhaps, maybe, lead to a better education for our children. So my question to you, I think, is simple. Okay? Uh -huh. We can all agree that the village plays an important role in the raising of our children. 
And we can also all agree that the school is a very important part of the village. So what I want to ask you is, how would you go about giving poorer families the choices that many of us already have in determining the types of schools that we want our children to be educated in? I think that is a, an important question because education um, is an investment not only for uh, the individual child and family but for the rest of us and we want to encourage uh, um, higher educational attainment. And what I think should be done is what we are currently seeing occur and that is the expansion of public school choice and the creation of charter schools within the public schools. I was just in Delaware yesterday, and Delaware has moved quite fast toward um, creating charter schools and public school choice. And in only a few years, they now have, um, I think, 5% of the students uh, transferring among public schools, and they see increasing numbers. Um, and I think that if you look at some of the school districts uh, in Manhattan and in Minnesota and in other places where public school choice uh, has been working for a while and is catching on. Um, I think it's a very important uh, educational reform and we ought to do even more to encourage it. And the charter school movement I think is equally significant um, because whether it's in Delaware where I visited a charter school or it's in the San Fernando Valley of California where I visited a charter school that uh, uh, had uh, turned around a very uh, bad situation. Um, letting people feel that they can invest themselves and their children by making a choice within the public school system. I believe within a relatively short period of time as more and more states and cities adopt public schools and create charter schools uh, will create conditions that I think will result in better schools even in some of our poorest neighborhoods. Uh, so I very much encourage and the President has done a lot of work uh, with Secretary Riley and others to promote public school choice and charter schools, and I think we should do even more than we have done up till now. The final panelist, uh, David Elwood, is the academic dean of the Kennedy School, but before that was Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. David. Hi there. Um, I also. Uh, Hi there. <laughs> nice to see you again. I also want to thank you for uh, emphasizing the false dichotomy between uh, family and government <clears throat> as though one can exist without the other. And obviously the important need is to recognize that government can be both a friend or a foe to the family and somehow to find a way that government neither abandons families nor makes their situation more difficult uh, or more desperate. And uh, obviously one of the places where I think a lot of people gov feel government has failed is in the welfare system where uh, among the harshest critics are welfare recipients themselves who talk about the isolation and the stigma and the humiliation of, uh, of the welfare system. And I think a large part of the problem, frankly, is that we've been in the wrong business. We've been doing eligibility and check writing as opposed to trying to find ways to help people help themselves. And, uh, and in the words of one recipient, I've been on off welfare for uh, 10 years. I've been in and out of the welfare office dozens of times and never once in that entire time did everyone, anyone ever ask me what's the problem or how can I help. So uh, it's clear that we've got a, a problem with the welfare system and it's clear that we've got to change it into something about helping people help themselves. So um, what we've now adopted is a welfare bill that gives unprecedented flexibility to the state level. We basically decided we don't want all these federal rules and regulations and uh, uh, eligibility focus and so forth. Um, and so we've given the states almost complete flexibility when the dust settles, I think, on this bill. And of course, in doing so, we've opened up um, both opportunities and great dangers. Um, the opportunities, of course, we've gotten rid of all the federal rules. We've also gotten rid of all the federal protections uh, that went with it. You have had um, a remarkable a career at various levels of government and probably are in a better position than almost anyone to sort of project what might happen and whether those who say this is a chance for hope, uh, how those hopes can be realized, and those who fear, gee, this is a chance for government not to do the right thing, but instead to abandon people or leave even further despair. So my question is just as simple as George's. Um, <laughs> it is, first, where do you think it's going to go? And second, for those of us that are fearful uh, about some of the downsides of some of this sort of thing, what can you, drawing on all your experience, propose that we focus on, both at the federal and the state level, 
uh, to try and make this a happy outcome where we actually do better for families as opposed to less? Well, I, th I think, David, that, um, you know, that is the right and the hard question about welfare reform. And I think we have to approach um, what we are doing with a great dose of humility, because I don't think we know the answer um, as, ex as to what exactly will occur. And we're going to have to be very vigilant in watching uh, the states and local governments as they implement uh, welfare reform. And we're going to have to be willing to make changes uh, if we see that uh, certain things are not working. But on balance, I guess I believe that this is a very hopeful opportunity. And I say that for a couple of reasons. I think that the debate over the welfare system, much like the false debate over family versus government, has been uh, mind-numbing, if not mind-stopping. And that people have not been able to get very far toward any appreciation of what the stakes are, what really does work, uh, how we can uh, strike the right balance in helping people move toward self-sufficiency, because the system, which as you say, everybody knew was broken, everybody deservedly criticized, um, was a conversation stopper. And so one thing we have done is to both uh, remove that as an excuse for refusing to confront the issues, and by doing so, create an opportunity for people honestly to talk about what do we need to do to do exactly what the other questions referred to. How do we create more of an investment in communities? How does government do it right? How do we create better schools and poor neighborhoods and on and on? So that is an opportunity for great potential and ferment. Now, we know based on, on a lot of the work that you did when you were at HHS uh, that some states are better prepared than other states, that some of the waivers and experiments that have been going on um, have proven to be successful and others have not. Uh, so we're going to go through a period of trying to figure out what will be uh, implemented and how it can work. Um, but I think that is an absolutely necessary period to go through, both to determine how states and localities can fulfill their obligations and to get a clearer view of what is the federal government role. I mean, we may end up uh, with people coming back and saying, well, we needed more protection during economic downturns. We hadn't really counted on that, so let's try this approach. Um, or they might come back and say, you know, we've now moved X percentage of people, but we still have this core of very hard, unemployable folks, and what we need to do is to skip that generation and do something especially focused on their children. I don't know what we're going to be hearing back, but I believe that we have an opportunity for the first time in 50 years uh, to ask ourselves the hard questions and to enlist a lot of people in helping to come up with the answers, because with the end of the welfare system and the end of the federal government entitlement, Everybody who has ever criticized this system now has to take responsibility for making sure that we help people who are genuinely in need, that we do enable families to get the jobs that are going to be required for them to be self-sufficient, uh, that we make sure no child is hungry, and that we do a lot of the other tasks that any caring village should do. And we will find out how well equipped we are to do that. Um, it's been hard to have the argument because we haven't really had the data. We haven't really said, okay, let's try something different, and we're about to do that. So I am optimistic, but very, very cautious, and I think all of us have to be very humble, and we have to be vigilant, and I would ask certainly that people here at the Center of uh, Social Policy and everywhere else uh, who is involved in studying these social issues um, play a role in being part of the evaluation, the early warning signal, the accountability. Um, and it's going to take a number of years before we really say we have reformed welfare. But I think we've have, we have a historic opportunity, and I'm glad we're going to take it and see where it leads. The third part of the program is questions from Harvard students. And we have two microphones on the floor, two in the balconies. Uh, let me remind you that uh, we should try to keep our questions brief so a number of people can participate. Uh, Oh, hi, uh, I'm Mike Joskal. I'm a member of the Student Advisory Committee here at the IOP uh, and an undergraduate at the college. Um, 
My question for you, Mrs. Clinton, is um, you've talked a lot about um, the fundamental technological changes sweeping society, um, which threaten to exacerbate the gaps between the haves and the have-nots. Um, but in the face of this great change, it seems that you've talked only of incremental policies, um, of starting a conversation of, um, of, and your husband has talked of things like the V-chip and, and school uniforms and other things. Um, but what large-scale policies, if any, would you suggest to meet um, the equally large problems which face our future? Well, I think, if, are you talking about technology issues or just well, in general? Uh, I guess in general, but and just relating to the, yeah. the sweeping bigger changes technology-wise. Well, one thing I would say about technology is that um, the president um, and vice president are committed to making sure every classroom in America is hooked up to the information superhighway. That is a national effort, uh, I guess equivalent to building highways during the 1950s. Uh, and that is a massive undertaking. And it will take uh, public and private money in order to be able to do that. Uh, so I anticipate that uh, the target date of 2000 can be met with uh, a rather significant uh, commitment. Uh, and I think it's very important that that be done. Um, so on that one issue, I would answer that that is something that goes far beyond uh, just saying everybody should have a computer, but a national commitment to make that happen. Okay, uh, my name is John Frank, and I'm here at the Kennedy School. I think that you're going to get a lot of public policy-oriented questions today, and I would like to ask you a personal question, and that is, as First Lady, what has been the most memorable experience that you've had in the last four years? Oh, being here. Uh, then can you tell me the second most memorable experience? Bringing my daughter to Harvard last summer. <laughs> you know, there are so many. I couldn't even begin to, um, to pick among them. Um, certainly, a, a lot of um, the people that I've had a chance to meet and talk with uh, during the last four years have made a, a very big impression on me. I'll, I'll just pick one. I mean, spending time with Nelson Mandela is a life-transforming experience, uh, and I write about that to some degree in the book. Uh, so being part of seeing history made, which sounds, I'm sure, a little bit uh, uh, trite to some of you, but I still get goosebumps when I walk in the White House. and. Uh, think about everything that has happened there uh, and see what's gone on even in these last four years. All right, thanks. Right side of the balcony. Hi, uh, my name is Patrice Keegan and I'm not a current student. I graduated about a decade ago from here. Uh, and I work at a place called Codman Square Health Center in Dorchester, Massachusetts. I'm the public policy director. And uh, for those of you who don't know Dorchester, it's a neighborhood in Boston and it's the kind of place that if you looked at it as demographics or statistics, you'd say, ah, a uh, distressed urban community. Um, but the people who live there, I mean, the good news is the people who live there know that Codman Square is a village. It's a village in practice. And my job, I'm a public policy director, I think a lot about the big picture village. How do neighborhoods like Codman Square work with the village of people who are passionate about public service, who live in places like Harvard, or live in places like the downtown corporate business interests, or live in Washington? Um, that's my job. On a day-to-day -day basis, people who live and work in Codman Square have much more modest goals and expectations. And I've spent a lot of time this week talking to people about the fact that I would get to be here and muscle my way up to the microphone. And I said, well, what, you know, what are you thinking about? People love the idea of it takes a village. They get it. They live it. They practice politics with a small p every day. And the kids that I talk to, who of course don't want to be called children, they're young people. They're the young brothers in the sisterhood of fire. They see themselves as part of the solution. So they have a lot to say on that. Uh, today I was talking with the grandparents group, people who've come together because they're grandparents who are raising their children's children. Uh, and they have a vision for those young people. And the conversations at all ends of the generational spectrum invariably come around to sort of a second question, which is, if it takes a village to raise a child, what does it take to keep the village strong? What does it take to heal a village? So I have like 22 questions I want to ask <laughs> you. <laughs> but people where I work and people where I live want you to know they're thinking about that. If there's any way that they can participate in that story, that would be great. 
Harriet says stop by for supper. And um, thanks for listening. Thank you. And thank you for working uh, in the community and for describing it so eloquently. But what you're describing is working. I mean, those, I mean when, I, when I talk about It Takes a Village, I'm obviously not talking just about or even primarily about geographical villages any longer, but about the network of relationships and values that do connect us and bind us together. Uh, and so the people you're talking to, by their interactions, by their commitments uh, to raise their grandchildren, to help each other out, uh, uh, to start businesses, uh, to improve schools, that's what keeps it strong and growing, and that's what we have to try to help um, others understand and encourage people to do. Thank you. We're in the phone book. Left balcony. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Daniel Rosenberg, and I'm a first year at the Kennedy School. Uh, the uh, president has laid out an extensive family agenda for the second term. Um, given the difficulty of uh, passing legislation in this, in this country, what do you think is likely um, to be the policy that the president first pursues in a second term that would help families? Well, I, I can't answer that specifically um, because I think his primary um, conviction is that we have to continue growing the economy and um, making it possible for not only jobs to be created, but those jobs to have rising incomes and uh, uh, stability attached to them. So he will, as he has done for the last four years, uh, put the economy, economic growth first and foremost, and look for ways of trying to make sure that economic growth is spread uh, into communities that might be distressed and not have uh, the opportunities that others take for granted. Uh, and there are a number of things he has said he would like to do uh, to continue that economic focus. And that's not directly a, a family issue, but to me it's the most important. It's a way of saying that, you know, we want to give you the tools, the economic opportunity to make decisions in your own life. On the strictly family work agenda and the family support uh, issues, uh, he has laid out a number of uh, programs that he would like to see passed, uh, starting with extending family leave, looking at ways uh, to provide more time to people by offering uh, those who work overtime the choice to take either time or money, uh, because the time and money crunch is real. And I think we need to do more to pay attention to people's needs to have more disposable hours as well as more disposable income. Uh, so there's a, a long list of uh, issues that uh, will need to be addressed, but it's kind of like talking about a no-hit game. Uh, I don't talk specifically or very long about anything that happens after November 5th. I kind of want to get there first, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Hi, my name is Allison Schutte, and I'm co-chair of the Women's Caucus and a graduate student here at the Kennedy School. And first, I'd like to thank you for your position as a role model for women and girls in this country, because um, the women... <laughs> as a woman with a graduate degree who really made it to the top of her profession. It's great to see for those of us in graduate school. So um, I was wondering how your perspective on the role of the first lady or even the first spouse has changed or evolved over the last four years, particularly based on the reaction your position in the administration has elicited in the public. Well, you know, that's... Um a difficult question for me to answer because I'm obviously on the inside looking out. Um, but I would just say a few things about that. I am struck by how uh, difficult this position uh, is for anyone who ever occupies it. And I go back and look uh, at uh, history and see all kinds of dilemmas and challenges that uh, women, starting with Martha Washington, uh, faced. Um, because it isn't a job. It has no job description. It is a very um, unusual role, and it is invested with meaning depending upon the historic times in which it uh, is uh, playing out and the person who occupies it. And I feel about what I'm doing now the way I've always felt about uh, my life or about women's lives, and that is that we should get to a point uh, where we don't impose stereotypes and expectations on women who fulfill their obligations the best they can to themselves and their families and to whatever um, public and private uh, interests they might have. 
uh, so that I don't feel comfortable talking about the role because I see it as a very um, particular experience that individual women will have. And I don't think anyone should be put in a position of being told or expected that she should do exactly what her predecessor did or what in the future a male um, person in this position would do. Um, and I think, I think the appropriate title probably is first mate. Uh, <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Loretha Green. I am a member of the Kennedy School uh, student government here. I'm also a graduate of the University of Arkansas, class of 1990. That's, I know that. I'm glad to see you. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. And I would like to, or I would like to ask you something about your own future. A lot of people want to talk about policy, but I'd like to know how you see yourself in the year 2000. Where, what would you like to do once the public service part of your life is being in the White House um, comes to a close? I'd like to sleep, <laughs> <laughs> take some vacations. Um, you know, I don't have an answer to that. I, um, I've never, I mean, you can't plan the kind of life that I've ended up having. I mean, it's not anything that, um, you know, I sat around saying, well, I think, you know, 1993, the man I marry will be president. Um, <laughs> that just doesn't happen. And I, and I think about, you know, the year 2000 sounds so far away to me, even though I know it's fast approaching, that I just want to continue doing what I've done for more than 25 years. And I get a lot of enjoyment out of it, uh, despite uh, uh, what might appear from the outside uh, as a lot of criticism. I don't really mind that. I consider that uh, as part of the territory. So I want to continue working on behalf of uh, uh, issues affecting women and children and families uh, and make my contribution in any way I can, but I have no idea what that will be. Thanks. Thank you. I think this is going to be the last question. Pressure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Heller. I'm the other co-chair of the Women's Caucus here at the Kennedy School, and I'd like to echo Allison's words of thanks for your role model. The White House has publicly stated that the Kennedy Kassenbaum health care bill has, is a good first step. During the second Clinton term, what do you see as being the second and third steps, and what role do you plan to play in formulating those steps? Well, I think that the Kennedy Kassenbaum bill is a good first step in moving toward um, portability and accessibility to affordable insurance. I think we took some additional steps that aren't as well known in dealing with uh, everything from, uh, you know, insurance fraud and better uh, uh, attention to uh, abuse in the Medicare and Medicaid systems. I'm very pleased about the passage of the 48-hour uh, rule for uh, uh, women with newborn babies and the move in uh, the legislation also to try to treat mental illness on a parity with physical illness and to recognize the continuum of health uh, needs that uh, mental illness represents. So I think in addition to the kennedy Casabon bill, some other very significant health care legislation uh, has been passed in the last two years. I think the President is right to say we've got to continue to try to figure out how to protect people who lose their insurance or are in danger of losing their insurance. And he has specifically uh, said he would like next to see us uh, provide support for people who are unemployed for six months so that uh, they don't lose their insurance. Uh, we have to look at how we're going to be sure that uh, uh, children are insured um, and a lot of other issues that are still on the front burner. Uh, but the the exact way that that will play out, I don't uh, have any uh, prediction for you right now, except to say the President has appointed a commission, or is in the process of doing so, to look at quality issues. Because what I hear as I travel around uh, from people is that they're concerned about what is being done to the quality of care and the interference with the doctor-patient relationship because of some of the restrictions that are being imposed by HMOs and other insurers. So that will be a big consumer issue, I would predict. Uh, so I think there'll be a lot of um, uh, activity around health care in the next uh, administration, and I think it will be bubbling up from the grassroots because people are 
now much more informed than they were in 1993 about what the real issues are. And I think that has been a major public uh, accomplishment so that people can feel that they are participating in a debate about what happens to health care. Clearly, there are enough questions and enough interest to keep Mrs. Clinton here for the rest of the day and probably into the middle of tomorrow, but that's not how First Lady's schedules work. <laughs> but it does demonstrate that we have a good excuse to invite her back again. So let's thank her. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. You did a great job. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Do you want to quickly shake some hands? Yeah, I, 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 I